Hello and welcome to Chapter 7, Environmental Policy, Decision Making and Problem Solving. So basically what you're going to want to get out of Chapter 7 is just a pretty good understanding of environmental policy, because that's basically all it covers. Alright, uh, environmental policy address addresses fairness and resource use. So first, uh, let's look at how uh, environmental policy addresses the concept that we've discussed before, known as tragedy of the commons. So again, tragedy of the commons, just a quick recap, is when... Uh, there is a certain resource or a certain plot of land that, say, a lot of shepherds want to use to feed their livestock, but no one really owns that grassland area, and so no one's, like, keeping it uh, well-maintained or paying for it. And so uh, the land could degrade and everyone could lose the resource. So basically, uh, the two main ways to uh, regulate a tragedy of the common situation are restriction of land use and uh, management of land use. Okay, now let's look into a concept known as free riders. So a free rider, it's basically, uh, the best way to explain that is to give an example. So the example in the book talks about factories. So say 10 factories are forced to regulate their pollution, but one doesn't actually do it and they get a free ride technically without having to limit their own pollution because they're just piggybacking on the other nine factories limiting their own pollution. So uh, some factories and other corporations try to be free riders and that's not a good thing and we're trying to eliminate that totally. All right, the next uh, thing that environmental policy addresses is uh, the external costs that we've talked about before. So the external costs would be like the pollution that neither the manufacturer or the um, consumer pays for. But uh, environmental policy is trying to address that issue. So currently there's something known as the polluter pays principle. And so basically what that means is that the person that is responsible for the pollution uh, has to foot the bill. But uh, a main problem when addressing environmental policy is that many businesses and people don't see the necessity of environmental legislation, and instead they just see it as an unnecessary annoyance since climate change is a very slow, gradual process that it isn't like right in your face that you can notice right away. So people are concerned that it's just like a waste of money for them to address pollution issues which is something we really need to work on because it's a pending issue. All right, now let's start looking at early U.S. environmental laws. So uh, basically, all of these laws together, and they're spanning from basically the late 1700s through the uh, late 1800s, they were essentially used to promote westward expansion and cultivation. So there was the General Land Ordinances of 1785 and 1787, the Homestead Act of 1862, the General Mining Act of 1872, and the Timber Culture Act of 1873. So basically, most of these were basically just giving people free land in the West so that they went out and started cultivating the West. And something such as like the Timber Culture Act basically said that if people were to go out West, they would get extra land if they started growing trees on that land. So that was basically the general theme through these early laws were to uh, promote Westward expansion. Now, the second wave of environmental policy uh, followed a policy of conservation. So, first off, in 1872, Yellowstone National Park here, as you can see, beautiful, was uh, established as the first national park. Next, in 1890, uh, 1891, the forest reserves uh, system was instituted. And basically what that meant was those uh, certain forest reserves were exempt from any logging, so you couldn't... Um, log and collect the timber and sell that timber in those forest reserve areas. And then uh, lastly, uh, in 1903, the Wildlife Refuge was passed, which basically just created Wildlife, Re wildlife Refuge, and that was passed by Teddy Roosevelt in uh, 1903, who was a big-time uh, environmental advocate. And as we move into this third wave of, uh, of environmental policy here, uh, basically the main theme running through that was this promoted recognition of the dangers of pollution and pesticide use. So a very famous book that you should know that's always good for a point here or there on a test or quiz is a book known as Silent Spring, which was uh, published by Rachel Carson, who's this nice lady over here, in 1962. Basically what Silent Spring did was uh, it was an anti-pesticide usage book, and it basically talked about the negative ecological um, effects of using pesticides such as DDT and things. And so um, also within this time period, there are many grassroots, grassroots excuse me, activists because, you know, it was in the 1960s, 1970s, all of that. And so a lot of um, activists promoted similar things to Rachel Carson against pollution, against pesticide use. Um, and then lastly, in this uh, little section, um, Earth Day was created on April 22nd, 1970, and that's uh, an annual holiday. 
Okay. Now let's look at the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, or NEPA. So uh, basically, the National Environmental Policy Act created a Council on Environmental Quality and, envir and uh, Environmental Impact Statements, which also are known as EIS. So environmental impact statements are basically uh, a report of results from a detailed study on effects of a new development funded by the federal government. So basically what this did was, say the federal government was going to fund uh, a new highway. Before that highway was built, there would have to be research and there would have to be calculations that basically showed the environmental effect that uh, building this highway would cause. And then from this report, the uh, government would weigh the pros and the cons of creating that highway and it would either happen or it wouldn't. So that was a big environmental step. Alright, so now let's look at the creation of the EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency. So basically, the EPA is in charge of conducting and evaluating, evaluating research, excuse me, monitoring environmental quality, setting and enforcing standards for pollution levels, assisting states in meeting standards and goals, and educating the public in general. Some main laws and acts that the EPA has uh, gotten passed that are pretty important to have a good understanding of are things such as the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Safe Water Drinking Water Act, and CERCLA, or uh, Superfund Projects. So those are always important to have in the back of your head. They're always going to come up on an FRQ or something, for example. All right, now let's look at approaches to environmental policy. So if you're uh, looking to enact some kind of change uh, in environmental policy, there are basically three main ways to go about it. So first, you can go through the court system. So there's something known as a tort law, which uh, essentially addresses harm caused to one entity by another. And so when looking at a pollution case, pollution files under something known as a nuisance law, which is a type of tort law. So you could take, say, a pollution uh, violation or something to court and hope to enact some kind of change from that way. Um, another approach would be a command and control policy. So basically what this is, it's a regulating agency prohibiting certain actions, setting rules, standards, or limits, and from there they uh, threaten to punish those who violate the terms. So you can use that as kind of an enforcing agent. Uh, and thirdly here, you can uh, go through economic policy tools. So basically how you can do this, you could basically uh, incentivize desired outcomes using subsidies or discourage certain uh, outcomes by doing the opposite and taxing. So you could do something known as a green tax, which are used to make companies pay back their environmental damage. So it's kind of like holding people accountable. That's how you can use uh, economic policy tools. Okay, now let's look at something known as permit trading. So permit trading in general is basically the government creating a marketplace for companies to buy and sell rights to conduct certain levels of potentially environmentally unfriendly activity. So a very important thing to know, this is very, very modern uh, environmental science, very trending issue, is something known as the cap and trade system. So there's a little diagram down here to help. Uh, so the cap and trade system is a permit trading system. So basically what that means is the government sets a maximum amount of pollution that it will accept overall, and companies then, within the marketplace, trade and buy and sell rights to certain amounts of pollution. So say uh, they set some, the government sets some limit, and there are 20 factories, right? And they, the factories have to, as a total, keep the pollution among them under a certain limit. So say the Nike factory uh, wants to be able to pollute a certain amount because that's how much it, they can feasibly uh, make their shoes and other products at. So within that marketplace, they would have to buy and sell um, different shares in the amount of pollution that they can create, essentially, with, say, the Adidas factory, who might not need as much pollution. And so that's basically how it works. So there's going to be a marketplace, and that's basically uh, what's going to be the future of uh, you know, pollution control. Okay, so now let's just look at the simple list of environmental policy, the, the process, essentially, on how you pass an environmental policy. So first, you're going to want to identify the problem, then pinpoint causes, envision a solution, get organized, cultivate access and influence, shepherd the solution into law, implement, assess, and interpret policy. So that's obviously good set, uh, good steps to take. Mr. Sun over here is pretty happy that he's getting his environmental policies passed. Okay, now let's look at inter international environmental policy. So uh, there is a lot of actually uh, international activity within the environmental policy field. So between the UN, the World Bank, the European Union, the World Trade Organization, and other non-governmental uh, organizations, they all work together in uh, certain conventions such as like the Kyoto Protocol or the Montreal Protocols, things like that, uh, where they combat environmental problems. 
And this is actually a good step that we're working on an international base on this because it helps make climate change not specific to country per se, but it makes it a global issue because really all of our resources are shared and so we need to attack this at an international level. Okay, conclusion. So basically chapter seven assesses environmental policy and uh, that's basically, it looks at the best ways to combat uh, environmental issues. And there are many different approaches, some more effective than others, but all you know, are pretty helpful considering they're helping the environment. Um, also recently we've been making this into an international problem and an international solution. So uh, that's a good step that we're broadening uh, the basis and everyone's trying to work together. All right, so uh, next chapter, chapter eight, we're gonna get into human population.